in these moments, we are in the dilemma of to be or not to be a philosophy. It's a famous quote, right? To be or not to be from mm -hmm. Shakespeare. And looking a little bit deeper, we either take or make the decision of attaining the self-realization or not. It's really what it is. It's, it's a choice. Like we're standing at the fork of a road. We either, you know, we're back to the normal way of living uh, with our consciousness sleeping under the influence of the ego, letting all those opportunities go by, or we take the other path and, and we change that and we attain the self-realization, the awakening of the consciousness. Uh, the four paths. In this world, there exist many religious forms all claiming to be the path to salvation, right? Nobody claims that they've got the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, can, you, you, know, you don't have to go very far before you can find people that are in all kinds of different religions and sects, and not even just um, like organized religions, different, different schools, different spirituality aspects. There's tons of people saying that, you know, this is the, this is the way to the truth or whatever. Um, unfortunately, most lead to a dead end. Very few people in this Iron Age awaken consciousness as the ego is too strong. There's a lot of degeneration and corruption that occurs in various religious organizations and schools and that kind of stuff. And that was one of the things um, that interested me about Gnosis. It's Master Samael put some very rigid things in place to prevent that from happening in Gnosis. One of the big things being we don't charge money. So nobody can be, cor can be corrupt and be in this just for the money kind of thing. Uh, when you guys get involved in Second Chamber, you'll see there's, there's, no, there's no degrees, there's no levels, there's no fancy ways of bragging, there's no hierarchy, there's nothing like that. Because these are things that, um, when given to the ego, uh, tend to corrupt. And we've all heard the expression, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? It's, it's the same idea. So when we look around at the world's religions, uh, a lot of them preach the dead word. Remember that many religions rise and fall within time, and where we are right now in the Iron Age is in the tail end of a lot of those religions. I mean, just look at the problem in the last decade or so that uh, Catholicism is facing, mm -hmm. with all the accusations and all the, the challenges that they're having. <clears throat> so unfortunately, there's a lot of different paths that we can take, but a lot of them, they lead to a dead end. They don't lead to the awakening of the consciousness, because so many religions don't preach or don't talk or don't educate people in the three factors. Christianity, for example, is very big on sacrifice, but they don't really do much at all with the death, and they don't even go anywhere near the birth. Okay, so you see that when you compare a lot of different religions and a lot of different paths, sometimes there's elements of the three factors, but it's rare to find a combination of all three of them. Uh, one of the big problems that we face, too, is when people look for salvation, when they look for divinity, when they look for, you know, something spiritual, something greater than themselves, that's always an external search for some reason. It's very rare for people to do that internally. And when we go back, you know, thousands of years to the origins of Gnosis, this is where Gnosis and Christianity uh, butted heads. And this is why the early Gnostics were actually uh, persecuted by the Christians, because the Christians needed this search, this salvation, to be an outside process. They needed a church and a hierarchy and a structure where the early Gnostics were saying, you don't need any of that. You don't need priests and bishops and popes and all that kind of stuff. Everything you need is found inside yourself. The church you need to go to is inside yourself. The connections you need to make are inside. And that was something that uh, was at odds with what Christianity was trying to do at the time. So that led to the persecution of the early Gnostics. Unfortunately, many people blindly follow religious leaders and organizations who preach the dead word. And remembering back to the quote we looked at about Master Samael, you know, don't follow me, I'm just a lighthouse for humanity. The idea being that it was a message important, but it's not the individual. Unfortunately, uh, we don't do that. We tend to really get hung up on who the people are and lose the message because that's the ego inside us that makes us want to do that. And the dead word is just that. It's just maybe at one time it, there, was, there was some truth, uh, there was some life to what was the teachings, but now so many people have forgot what the teachings really mean, or there's been so much corruption in the generation that the path has been veered away from a long time ago. People end up choosing faith in the word of others rather than experiencing the knowledge from themselves. And that really sets uh, the path that we're trying to walk on a lot different than a lot of the, you know, 
places or religions, you know, Christianity and that kind of stuff, where you're almost told that you can't connect to divinity directly yourself. You have to go through the priest or the bishop or whatever. He does it on your behalf. The idea being that uh, for many years too, even those, you know, religions like Christianity and that kind of stuff, they wouldn't even make the books like the Bible available to the common people. Okay, so it was almost a, a, a way that it was kept for the religious elite sort of thing, rather than something that everybody could experience directly for themselves. And that's something that we know from studying Gnosis, that this is something that is built on experience. It's built on direct experience. It's built on things that we know for ourselves. We're able to test the knowledge. We're able to experience it directly, rather than just blindly following what other people say or what other people write. What really counts in life is what's inside oneself. So in the end, it doesn't matter what group, what sect, what religion, what path you belong to. It's not simply belonging to the path that's going to get you anywhere. So it doesn't matter just because you, you, know, you want to say you're Gnostic or you belong to Gnosis. That's not going to get you anywhere. It's the work that you do. It doesn't matter whether you're Buddhist. doesn't matter whether you're Christian. In the end, it's not who you belong to. It's the work that you do because it's the work that leads to the experience that leads to the transformation and the change. So it's not that saying that Gnostic is, or being Gnostic is the only way for awakening of consciousness. That's not what we're saying at all. We're saying that there's a lot of different paths that will get you there, but unfortunately many people get lost on the way. And in the end, it doesn't matter what path it is. You've heard the expression, all rivers flow to the ocean. It doesn't matter how you get there, as long as you get there. And the important thing is what's inside, the process that you're doing, the work that you're doing. It's not simply good enough to say you belong to a particular organization or another. And that's not to say that you know somebody who's Christian can never awaken consciousness, or somebody who is you know studying Jewish Kabbalah can never reach consciousness. That's not what we're, what we're saying at all. Each person longing for spiritual elevation can walk one of four paths. So we're going to look at a, a process that people can go on, and we're going to look at some um, some common paths that you find people taking when they encounter uh, more elevated religious studies. And we'll talk about some of the positive attributes of the path, but we'll also talk about some of the negative attributes of the paths as well. These are different ways that people, um, or different paths people can walk down, or different ways people can go when they're searching for something uh, uh, more elevated, more spiritual. Uh, each path that we're going to see uh, ends up developing certain centers. So in many ways the four paths can actually serve a certain purpose. And sometimes we find when we come back again and again from lifetime to lifetime, we may have found that we have worked or walked some of these paths ourselves. Because sometimes we find ourselves walking these different paths that teach us about different centers and help prepare us for different aspects of the final journey that we walk. Remembering back to, well, I think, the fifth class we ever had, the intellectual, the motor, the emotional, the instinctive, and the sexual center, right? That's, that's not new for us. That's just a review. Each of the paths we're going to look at is really focused on developing one particular center or learning to dominate or control <coughs> one particular center. The first path we're going to look at is the path of the Fakir, and that's a, a Fakir right there. Um, <coughs> there's another guy right there. This has got, what has he got, like hooks with weights hanging off of him. That looks like a very uncomfortable position. He's got like these blades or things stabbed through his tongue. I don't even want to know what that guy's doing with his leg. <laughs> <laughs> it just does not look comfortable. Okay. Looks distorted. Oh my God. The fakirs, they, they were uh, very famous in India, right? Um, and they're capable of amazing feats with the physical body. They can do all kinds of really bizarre stuff. Uh, there was one famous fakir that for, I don't know, I think it was like decades, just stood on one leg. There was another famous fakir that raised his hand and never ever put it down again. And it was so gross because when we looked at the picture of him, his arm was all mangled and atrophied because he let, put it over his head and he never took it down for like 30 years or something like that. Oh my God. But why? Yeah. why? Yeah. Well, we'll get to that. Oh. There was another one that uh, rolled across India. India's a pretty big wow. roll. I mean, like, lay on the ground and roll. And every day he would roll further, and he would have these, these followers that would attend to his needs, bring him food, bring him water, and he literally rolled across the country. Okay? The stories of fakirs that would bury themselves for days on end, and then the followers would dig them back up, and they'd simply ask for a glass of water, brush themselves off, and continue on. 
Okay, the Fakirs are, are capable of doing really amazing feats with the physical body. Um, they've been studied by all kinds of elements <coughs> of medicine and science. They can slow down their respiratory system and their metabolism to almost a standstill. They can like jab giant needles through parts of their body and not feel any pain. They're really interesting in that sense. What it, oops, what it is they're doing is developing perfect control of the motor center. Okay, so they're learning to dominate the motor center. They're learning to gain perfect control over the motor center. So they feel no pain, they feel no discomfort. Things that you and I can't even imagine doing, they're able to control. Processes like respiration and digestion and that kind of stuff. They actually have physical control over that. And they can slow down all those different elements or functions of the body. They have an unbreakable will. Like, think about it, to keep your arm over your head for, you know, decades? Seriously. <laughs> they reach a superior dominion of all their muscles, bones, and even vital organs. They have amazing control over the motor center and what they can do with that. But unfortunately, that's all they ever develop. The only thing they ever really master, the only center they ever really control, is the motor center. And all they end up doing is developing tremendous willpower. They don't eliminate any ego, they don't awaken the consciousness, they don't develop solar bodies. They're just solely focused on controlling that motor center. So although they, they are doing all this in the name of uh, spirituality or in the name of certain gods, you know, they'll do it to honor Shiva or honor a particular god or something like that. So you can say, well, they're on a spiritual path, but it's a path that really just ends up developing the willpower and developing the motor center. They don't um, reach the awakening of the consciousness. They don't develop any of the solar bodies. Their enormous willpower serves them no purpose in reaching the intimate self-realization of the being. So it's a little bit of a, of a dead end. It's an, an advanced spiritual path and it takes a lot of dedication and you know, a, a lifetime of effort, but unfortunately it doesn't lead that self-realization of the being. It becomes more of a distraction than anything else. Uh, they have followers and they're worshipped as religious leaders. To keep your hand above your head or stand on one leg, you kind of need people to take care of you, to bring you food, to bring you clothes, to bathe you and that kind of stuff. So the Fakirs were famous and they did have large groups of followers that, that take care of them and that almost worshipped them as kind of like demigods. But in the end, they're not really accomplishing that, that final goal, that ultimate goal. <clears throat> Fakirs become, in the end, masochists, mistreating their body in an attempt to please God. I mean, this is the, this is the vehicle that we've been given, and these are guys that are, that are abusing it in an attempt to reach that kind of self-realization. And that's why they're not able to do that. They're just mistreating their physical body in an attempt to please divinity. They're just damning the physical ve sorry, they're just damaging the physical vehicle that nature has bestowed, bestowed upon them in order to form the solar bodies that, so they can reach the total realization. Remember that we came from a much higher place, and we've been put into this, this, this place, this physical world, which is like the womb or place of gestation for the angelic beings. That's why we have the physical body, because the physical body contains the seeds that we need for self-realization. All the Fakirs end up doing is abusing that vehicle and not taking advantage of the abilities that they have in the physical body to create the solar bodies. There's another guy. Stuff through his face there and there and all these weights and hooks and things hanging off of them. Uh, and interestingly enough, they, are, they're, they don't they stay away from women. They don't marry. They stay celibate, but they don't practice alchemy. They don't work with transmutation. So they're kind of, they know it's something to do with, you know, energies and it's kind of a good thing. And you, you, they shouldn't be spilling energies, but they don't really know how to use them to create the solar bodies. They don't practice mm -hmm. alchemy. Then we get to the path of the monk. That's probably one of the more famous ones, at least in Western society, because we're all familiar with the concept of the monk, right? There's a, an early Franciscan monk, and then, of course, we have Buddhist monks as well. If you look at the path of the monk, it's not really just uh, Christian monks. There's Shaolin monks, there's Buddhist monks, there's different kinds of monks. Now, with the monk, uh, if on a previous existence we're on the path of the fakir, there's a chance we could return to walk the path of the monk. So after we've developed control over that motor center, we can then perhaps in the next life walk the path of the monk to learn to control another center as well. You can kind of sometimes think of these things as like preparatory paths for the final journey that we can find ourselves on. Uh, monks spend their time enclosed in a monastery in constant prayer and meditation. What do you, you think monk, you think meditation, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you think of Buddhist monks and Shaolin monks and that kind of stuff. Okay, or even Christian 
monks. We don't associate Christianity much with meditation, but actually there's a lot of meditation associated with Christianity and associated with Judaism as well. It's just not very mainstream. Um, that's one thing we know about monks is they're, they're, they pray a lot and they work, they work a lot with the sacrifice for humanity. <coughs> The monk is characterized by their unbreakable faith. They basically shut themselves away from society and devote their entire life to God. Uh, but that faith is blind and dogmatic based on belief rather than direct experience. Because the monks are still working in that hierarchy of the priests and the bishops and the archbishops and the deacons and all that kind of thing. They're just one kind of cog in that overall machine. And one of the things that... Um, monks do, they're not doing this kind of stuff to experience any, to experience any of this directly, they're more just, just following the, the rules of, of what monks are supposed to do and following the lifestyle. And there's a lot of rules that are associated with the lifestyle of a monk that's all basically spelled out for you. <clears throat> monks develop power over the emotional center. That's really what they're doing throughout the course of their life. They don't achieve that self-realization either, because once again, they're not working with the three factors. Okay, they're not working on the death of all the egos, and they're not working in alchemy. Okay, monks and nuns are usually separated from each other, and you know they're not supposed to be uh, intermingling in that sense. Monks are supposed to devote themselves in their entire life to the path of God. They're not supposed to be not getting married and that kind of thing. So consequently, like the fakirs, they're not developing the solar bodies either. I'm not, not working on, with the uh, elimination of the egos. They're really just developing the emotional center. And that's something that they do through that constant prayer, through that constant prayer and, and meditation as they're learning to control that area. After the month, we look at the yogi. And if you're alive in the 60s, you remember when this was kind of a big deal, right? And that's the guy, what was the Beatle guy called? Yeah. No, oh, not Rashi. No, not Rashi. What's his name? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, and yeah. Osho? No. Yeah. But no, it wasn't that guy. The Beatles were very famous because they were running around with this guy, and suddenly everybody in the '60s was all about having yogis, and tons of people went to India to meet yogis, and there was tons of people in India that were setting up kind of like yogi places to take all these crazy mm -hmm. people from the West that had a ton of money and a sudden interest in their religion. Okay, there's another example of a, a yogi from India. <clears throat> After the path of the monk, there's a possibility we can return to walk on the path of the yogi. And the path of the yogi is all about the intellectual center. These guys are masters of intense meditation. Just like the fakir was basically able to do these amazing feats with the physical body, the yogi is able to do these amazing meditation feats. <clears throat> they develop great powers of concentration through the dominion of the mind. These guys are able to, these are, these are guys that will go into meditation for literally weeks on end. They won't eat, they won't sleep, they'll just be meditating the entire time. That's one of the things that yogis are known for. And that's why in the 60s, you know, the Beatles and all that kind of stuff, everybody was getting into the New Age movement, and the big thing was meditation. And that's why people were following yogis around. Uh, they develop great skill in concentration and meditation, and we know how important that is in the work, right? Through meditation, they reach high levels in the inner worlds. They're able to develop occult powers and can experience mystical states such as samadhi. The word samadhi itself is an Indian word, and it comes from experiences that yogis have when they submerge themselves quite high into the superior dimensions. So yes, the yogis have experiences with that concentration and meditation. They're able to develop lots of different powers, lots of different faculties. They're able to, to see into the higher dimensions and accomplish all kinds of things like that, which brings them a lot of followers, which brings them a lot of attention. But the only problem is, just like we saw with the other ones, um, they're only temporary. They don't develop the solar bodies. So yes, they can meditate for days on end, and during those meditations, they can have all kinds of glimpses of things in the superior worlds. They can experience samadhi. They can see all this stuff, but it's just temporary. When they die, they come right back to a physical body again. So although they're revered and worshipped in their culture as these elevated spiritual masters, they're not real masters in the sense that when they die, they come back because they haven't eliminated the ego. So they find themselves still trapped on the wheel of samsara. And that's somehow talks about how there was a particular famous yogi that had thousands of followers, but when he died, he came back into a regular simple body. And that's what somehow was able to explore in the higher dimensions where he reincarnated and how he came back. And it was just an average person like everybody else. 
okay? The yogis believe themselves to be very powerful because they have that experience, but because they're not working on the death of the ego, that experience just feeds the ego. So they think of themselves as powerful spiritual masters, and they collect a lot of disciples and a lot of attention that way. Okay, they have many devoted followers, um, and especially when we look at what happened in the 60s, there was tons of people following particular yogis around the world. But after death, as I mentioned, the great yogis return to the valley of tears as common people. They don't work on the awakening of consciousness. Yes, they experience stuff in the higher dimensions. Yes, they develop great powers and control over the intellectual center and can do these amazing feats. Yogis are big. Um, the stories of yogis meditating and floating in the air. The stories of yeah. yogis being able to do all kinds of like quasi miracle things like that. But in the end, they're only temporary states because they don't. Uh, they don't develop a solar body, so they don't have the vehicles to go to after death, so they come right back to a regular physical body. Uh, would that be the same like a guru, yogi? Yeah, guru, yogi, this is basically the same guru word. Maharishi yeah. Maharishi. yeah, he was a yogi. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, guru just means, the word guru just means teacher. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's all. It's like saying, for people that study <clears throat> martial arts, like saying sensei. It's sensei, a, yeah. A, a word okay. that means teacher. Uh, and the path of the yogi, that's where we get yoga, which is so crazy popular right now. Everybody's into yoga, right? Every time I turn around, people are talking, all oh, the guys I work with are like doing hot yoga. I'm like, what is wrong with you people? But I think they're in it more for the opposite sex than they are for the spiritual awakening. Now, hot yoga, have you seen that? Where you do yoga in like a sauna? So like the room is like 150 degrees, and then you do yoga in it? It's weird. Yeah, but if you have high blood pressure, they don't... Uh, the word yoga itself, really what it means is union with God, right? And a yogi is one who has union with God, or so they say, right? So a yogi creates the perception that they're in communication with God. And it's through yoga that we seek that union of God. And there's different types of yoga that could be practiced. Nowadays, yoga basically means exercise and physical fitness, mm -hmm. but it didn't used to be. Yoga, or originally, yoga were basically types of meditation involving postures mm -hmm. of the physical body, various asanas. Uh, there's bhakti yoga, which was the yoga of devotion, and that developed uh, devotion and a type of temporary illumination. Because once again, you're able to see things, you're able to experience things, you're able to develop uh, faculties and powers, awaken some chakras to a certain extent, but all of that was basically being funneled to the ego, because we weren't working on the death of the ego, so we weren't uh, able to develop the solar bodies. There's Dana Yoga, and that's Yoga of the Mind, uh, that teaches disciplines of the mind, and the whole point of Dana Yoga was to experience the Samadhi, basically merging back with that source. Yes, a very, very profound experience, but it doesn't matter how high you go up, when you die, you start right back at the bottom again, so there's no progress being made, because we're not seeing them working in the three factors. There's Raja Yoga, and that was all about chakras. Basically, we, the knowledge we have about the chakras, a lot of that comes from this particular discipline of yoga. Okay, so it was all about awakening the chakras to develop things like clairvoyance, clairaudience, um, that kind of stuff, telepathy. There's uh, Kundalini Yoga, which is popular, which was originally called Agni Yoga, which <laughs> meant fire, and that's working with the sexual energies. That was, this is an interesting one, because it almost takes us to the fourth path, but the fourth path is beyond the grasp of the yogi. Okay, so we're getting pretty close here to, to where the, the final goal where we need to be, but it doesn't quite make it there. Okay, because we're not working with the death of the ego, we're not working with alchemy. This one recognizes the kundalini as sexual energy, and learns to control it to a certain degree, but doesn't really go so far as working in alchemy with a partner, and doesn't deal with the death of the ego. And if we always carry the ego, then we're always going to be held back. If we're always feeding the ego, then we're going to never realize the awakening of the consciousness. Okay, and that was uh, Agni Yoga. And you can see, you can, get, you can take Kundalini classes in town, as an example. I was, you know, I was wondering what exactly people think that they're doing while they're doing that. I mean, like <laughs> exercise, I guess. But. Then we get to the fourth path. The fakir, the monk, and the yogi recognize the significance of the sexual energies. They kind of have an idea that, yeah, maybe just, you know, 
You should, the sexes should be separate somehow. You can't just be losing the energies, but they all end up celibate, which is like almost like a... Uh, uh, they have the right idea, but they've implemented it the wrong way. They know they shouldn't be spilling the energy, but they don't understand the concept of alchemy and creation with the opposing energies. So they know losing energies is bad, but they don't know about transmutation. They don't know about alchemy. Uh, they avoid the opposite sex, consequently, and do not work with alchemy, which is their downfall. Because in the end, they're all seen, especially in our society, as kind of like elevated spiritual figures to a certain degree. But when their life is over, they all come back. I mean, even the Dalai Lama reincarnates in the physical body again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Great spiritual teacher, but still stuck in this plane, still trapped in the physical body. These three paths don't use all of the three factors for the revolution of the consciousness. And that's the point that we're really trying to make with this lecture. In the end, it's the importance, it's the balance of the three factors. The birth, the death, and the sacrifice. That's what leads us to the final liberation. Doesn't no matter what path we go down, we're not uh, uh, thinking of ourselves as superior. We don't say, well, Gnosis is the only way. And if you're not studying Gnosis, then you're completely wasting your life. We're not saying that at all. We're just saying that whatever path people go down, if it's not working with the three factors, then it's not going to lead you to the final liberation. There's a lot. There's experiences that can be had along the way. There's things that can be learned, but they don't lead towards the the, the final awakening of the consciousness. And in where we are in the end of the Iron Age of the Aryan race, that awakening of consciousness is vital. A lot of people on this planet right now are getting close to the end of their 108 lives. If it's not the 108th already, you don't have time to mess around taking a dozen or so lives to walk through these paths until we find the right one. That's why Master Samuel's message was so important, because we can skip all of this. And we can say, this is what I need to do. These are the three factors that I need to incorporate. And we can work towards that liberation now in order to escape um, the events that will come with the times of the end before the beginning of the next race. And then we too can enjoy uh, the experience of the golden age of the next race. Remembering that um, one of the things Master Samal teaches is, you know, in order to escape the times of the end, in order to progress into the golden age of the next race, it's not like we have to be awakened spiritual masters. He talks basically 50% of the ego would be enough. Eliminate half your ego, that would have enough awakened consciousness to basically get through the times of the end and begin uh, in the golden age of the next race. Yeah. What are the times of the end that he refers to? I've never heard of this. Yes, you have. We did the class on the oh, oh okay. The I that one you're talking about. I was going to say, right. you've got it on video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the work with the third factor, sacrifice, is common on these paths. Okay, so you look at these people, and you know, they're often trying to help humanity, they're trying to teach humanity. Uh, monks and nuns in particular devote their entire life to sacrifice of humanity. You think of like Mother Teresa as an example. You know, definitely working on the path for sacrifice, but not working on the death of the ego and not working on the creation of the solar bodies, the birth. Maybe she didn't have any egos so. <laughs> She lived in poverty and uh, mm -hmm. she, yeah. I don't know, I didn't see a, a, a phony or, or a pretentious person. It doesn't have to be phony but maybe, or pretentious. May, but, maybe yeah. she already, but maybe she did work on her yeah. uh, it, it's possible to work on your uh, egos or whatever they call them, you know, mm -hmm. different religions, mm -hmm. they call them different mm -hmm. things, your sins or whatever, to be without sin. So and the thing I'm basing that on is never, that was never part of her teaching. So if she was doing it, she was doing it on a personal oh, level. She I, I don't know what her teaching sharing. was. It was just to love everybody, yeah, I guess. Yeah, she wasn't talking and promoting, practicing the three factors. So, But yeah, yeah you never know where people are at an internal yeah. level. Sometimes we don't even know where we are. <laughs> internal level, which yeah, is but the unfortunate definitely thing, not right? practicing alchemy. <laughs> yeah, that's thank you for that visual image. Uh, they don't no practice way. alchemy with oh, a spell, so that point. There's nothing about these three paths that stress the, the work of alchemy. <coughs> uh, Gnostic <coughs> science teaches there is only one path to arrive at that union with the divine. And that path, you can call it whatever you want. Remember, Gnosis just means wisdom, okay? But that path has to incorporate the three factors. So if you're a Buddhist, work in the three factors, great. If you're a, a rabbi, work in the three factors, perfect. If you're a priest working with the three factors, that works too. It doesn't really matter 
what path, because any path working with the three factors is the only path. Doesn't matter how you get there, doesn't matter what your background is when you start the three paths, the path is um, working with the birth, the death, and the sacrifice. But in Gnosis, we recognize that before we can arrive at the one true path, many times people have to walk through different preparatory paths. So it's not like you go, oh, these are bad. It's not bad to be a monk, bad to be a yogi, or bad to be a fakir. They're just people taking a different route to get there. Just like if you know you were going to go from here to somewhere downtown, each of us could take a different path and end up at the same destination. Some are just longer than others and have more distractions along the way. In the end, if you get there, that's all that matters. Can you say that the other ones are kind of, uh, they go to extremes? Yeah. You know, they take one extreme and that's it. Yeah. And that's they don't remember, kind of combine. You know, no, they're, they're not balanced. Remember, not that's balanced. one of the other things that we're trying to do is attain is that balance. point of balance, mm -hmm. right? And those are definitely not very balanced. I remember one of the key things we're trying to do with eliminating the ego is to balance the energies. Mm -hmm. Because if we're always using one center more than the others, mm -hmm. we're going to deplete mm -hmm. that energy. While the monk is always drawing on the emotional center, right. the fakir is always drawing on the motor center, and the yogi is always drawing on the intellectual center. So yeah. they're not balancing those no. energies. No, just using one that's like yep. too extreme. The fourth path contains elements of the fakir, monk, and yogi, but it is none of these things. Okay, because the fourth path is that balanced path. These paths are incomplete. They isolate themselves from the world and remain celibate. So they don't work with the elimination of the ego, and they don't work in alchemy with transmutation. Okay, they don't work in that perfect matrimony. They stay celibate, and they don't actually complete it. The fourth path includes the key of the Ark of the Covenant, which is, you've probably heard about the Ark of the Covenant before, right? The key of the Ark of the Covenant is alchemy, the perfect matrimony. Okay, and it was said the Ark of the Covenant had the two angels on top, the male and the female, in that embrace, and that touch. That's the, the Ark of the, the Covenant, that's really what that's all about. The fourth path works with the dominion of willpower, the emotions, and the mind, but in a balanced way. Okay, and that's just what we were talking about, the concept of that balance has to be there, or else we're always using, overusing one center more than the others, which is not a balanced way to live. We need to separate ourselves from the currents of the extreme right and extreme left, and walk the balanced path in order to experience that which is real. And we looked at that concept when we talked about the law of the pendulum, right? Finding that path of balance right in the middle. That's exactly what we're talking about here as well. We must avoid the battles and conflicts that exist between extreme right and the extreme left, which is the same thing as looking at the Tao from the Orient, finding that, that path of balance, that central path, the middle pillar. Instead, we must self-explore ourselves in a direct way to self-know and self-discover. And that ties right back to, remember class one, what the Greeks had over the doors of the temples? myself. <laughs> This leads to the experience of that which is real, that which is the truth. So working with the three factors, limiting that ego so we can maintain that balance, working in alchemy to create the solar bodies, and the whole time doing sacrifice for humanity. <laughs>